Okay, so I'm sitting here because there's a camera there. So we are streaming, we are streaming internationally, and I hope somebody will, we, we usually have like 10 or 15 people are listening remotely, so it would be great. Um, thank you. <laughs> somebody turn the light off. It's okay. So welcome to um, the um, Artside Salon slash laser. Um, uh, Artside Salon is a series of events that takes place every month. Um, so this month we are, and they are theme oriented, so every time we have different people. We have like a, a few people who have uh, come here quite regularly, but most of the people today are different. So. Uh, welcome, and I hope you'll come. Uh, we reinvent the wheel every month. Huh? We reinvent the wheel every month. Yeah, every month, well, because we have different uh, themes. Like we talked about mathematics, we talked about uh, big data, we talked about uh, we have something on geometry, we have an exhibition, so like everything is like, very different. Anyway, today we're going to talk about games, but of course, as usual, we don't want to talk about games as games. Uh, the usual, the usual stuff. What we want to talk uh, about, uh, uh, as Cindy was suggesting, art infused games and game infused art, and uh, are basically uh, games that do not just stick to playing, stick to games, but uh, talk about other issues like aesthetics or disabilities or um, uh, I don't know politics maybe. Um, so, uh, and this is, uh, uh, this is the topic uh, for today. Um, before we start, I just wanted to say that this is, an, this is a series of events that is uh, uh, funded by Ontario Arts Council and is uh, uh, hosted by the Fields Institute. We are the Fields Institute for Mathematical Sciences here. You see a lot of boards here because <laughs> there's a lot of mathematicians. And uh, it's also uh, one of the series, uh, uh, part of the laser, which is the uh, laser. Is, uh, Nina will introduce it to us because there, I'm, I'm really bad with acronyms, so. and uh, and this is why we are streaming our event so that people from outside Canada and outside Toronto can hear us. Okay. Nina, thank you. Thank you, all the presenters, and thank you very much, uh, our, uh, our audience who came. Uh, my name is Nina Tsekinedi, and I am uh, on the Leonardo board, uh, as well as uh, the organizer in Canada, which is right now only in Toronto and Montreal, of the Leonardo Arts and Science Evening Rendezvous. And that's the acronym. That's the acronym. The laser actually started a few years ago. We have a website, and uh, it, right now it spans the entire US, mostly academic venues. And uh, it just starts to expand into Europe, in London, and Missouri. <coughs> so uh, I do hope that we can expand our laser network in Canada a little bit too. And if anybody has any ideas, either future lasers or uh, other sites, open to topics, please let us know. We work together with Rebecca always very closely. Thank you very much. And Cindy. OK, so I'll introduce Cindy. And I also say, uh, by the way, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Robert Ambiani, and uh, the co-organizer is Stephen Morris, who's always talking. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we'll have tonight uh, Cindy Puremba, and uh, and followed by uh, Anna Lu and uh, uh, Martin Shu. Uh, but Cindy is a professor in design at Sheridan College. Uh, she speaks internationally at conferences and invited lectures and has published her work in several journals, edited collections and magazines. She also organizes uh, as an independent curator and creates um, games and new arcade events as a member of the Kokoromi Experimental Game Collective. 
which I saw the website for, it's very nice. Two keywords <laughs> characterize our work. Um, as I said before, art infused games and game infused art. Thank you. So, uh, full disclosure, I, although I do uh, speak fairly frequently, I don't, um, I realize that I seldom speak about my work, and it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit strange. So I'm going to try to keep it short, um, I'm going to hopefully keep it somewhat focused, and mostly I actually want to see the game on disability, so I, um, <laughs> I, I'm going to hopefully kind of rush through so um, so that I can see that. So thank you, everybody, for, for coming and uh, uh, listening to what is hopefully not going to be too awkward a presentation. Um, uh, mostly, uh, when I was uh, uh, putting this together and realizing that, again, this is probably not the area I most commonly speak on, um, I ran across a presentation that I gave at, as part of Convergence at the BAMP Center last, uh, it was last winter. It was definitely last winter, actually. I remember it was minus 40. Um, and, uh, and that presentation was uh, centered around my curatorial work, um, specifically some of the uh, shows that I had done. Um, one was focused on women's contribution to game design. It was hosted by um, the um, Museum of Art and Design in Atlanta. Uh, another one was a show that was at the um, Gaete Lyrique in Paris that was focused on uh, artistic approaches to playful culture. And uh, that show was a particularly large one that had a number of commissioned works that were, uh, that were in it. And um, so part of what I wanted to do in that scenario, and I realize I can kind of bring it up now to try to contextualize my work, and it makes my work look good because I've just opposed it. It's very, very uh, well done and um, uh, nice uh, and lovely projects. Uh, is uh, uh, kind of an increased uh, place for really um, well done contributions between people who were uh, artists from other disciplines outside of games and people who were uh, professional game designers or who had an established game design practice. And as a curator, this is really important to me because what I had um, unfortunately seen a lot of in kind of my early days of game curation, I've probably been curating games for over a decade, uh, and before that, interactive art projects in general, uh, was that um, generally speaking, oftentimes you didn't have, uh, you would have games uh, that would come from the uh, game side of things that didn't seem to treat art seriously as a, uh, as a field and a discipline with the history. Um, and sometimes you would see, conversely, you would see artistic projects that would use the context of a game without really understanding kind of core principles of game design or really treating game design respectfully, again, as an artistic practice and as its own discipline. So what was nice about uh, some of these uh, uh, collaborations was that it brought together people who, who just seemed to have this great mutual respect for each other's expertise and artistic prowess in, the, in their um, respective areas. Um, that's not to say that Game designers can't create beautiful, artistic, um, you know, um, significant works or vice versa, that artists can't create very interesting games or that games have to be necessarily very complex. Um, but, um, but it was that when you combined kind of a, um, a, a solid artistic practice and a, um, a solid game practice together, that oftentimes you ended up with these amazing, amazing projects. Uh, so, and some of the projects that... Um, uh, that I had shown at, at least when I was talking at uh, at, at Banff, included things uh, like Flex, which is a, a collaboration between uh, Han Hoverberg and uh, uh, Sander Vandervan. Um, interference. Uh, so uh, Sander is a, uh, um, a game designer, and obviously Han is a uh, really well-known multimedia uh, and web artist. Um, yeah, there's some sort of fishy thing going on here. Uh, so uh, Interference was a, um, uh, was a work that we had commissioned at the VAT of the which is a collaboration between Natalie uh, Posse and um, Eric Zimmerman. Uh, and uh, Natalie is an uh, architect, and so she created these beautiful, beautiful, these are metal, um, it's almost like a metal lace panels uh, that uh, kind of fill this, uh, fill this empty space. And then the game that uh, is played within it uh, can be played uh, with a small group, but ideally it's actually played when there's a number of different uh, games going on at the same time. And part of the gameplay is to steal pieces from other people's games. So it's explicitly designed to get people to uh, 
interact within this, uh, this public environment. But then also as an architectural piece to kind of sit invisible in the space so it doesn't necessarily need to be played in order to be, um, to be seen and to be um, uh, enjoyed within the space. Uh, Kid Operette was an amazing piece uh, that we also commissioned. That was a collaboration between uh, Daily to Le Jour, which is a, uh, a in, uh, interactive art and installation um, uh, collaboration that, um, from Montreal uh, with a um, uh, shoot. I'm completely blanking on her name right now because she's leader host in Lucille, and I always think about that when I call it, oh, and I think her name. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and so they had collaborated on creating a game that uh, allowed you to instantiate an operette. So uh, as you went through and you played various um, aspects of the game, the operette proceeded. So you got to a new stage of the, um, of, of the overall story in it. So it's a very beautiful um, theatrical piece that also has, uh, has game design elements of it. Um, and then even um, Pippin Barr, who's now at, um, at Concordia in Montreal, uh, uh, has a, a really fun collaboration with um, Marina Abramovich that's based around uh, her practice and kind of converting it into very simple kind of, uh, kind of game pieces. Uh, anyway, so all of these works I, um, I thought were not only incredibly inspiring, but that they also demonstrated something really important uh, that I wanted to see more of in game design. Unfortunately, one of the things that has tended to happen with, um, with game design, even artistic uh, game design, or, in, or probably more independent game design, is this real sense of insularity. There are so many games that are about other games. And there are a number of reasons why uh, that is perhaps not as rich as it can be in terms of being a creative practice. But, um, uh, but one thing that was nice about these collaborations, aside from the fact that it just expanded that viewpoint beyond you know, people who already knew things about games, uh, was first of all that they were cross-disciplinary engagements um, and they were substantive. They were respectful of both areas of design. They weren't just using game design in the service of, a, of an art piece or art in the service of making a game look really pretty. Um, they both, all of the pieces had elements where you could look at and you can say that is an interesting artistic element, that, that, you know, that's a contribution to whatever the art practice is, this is a, contrib this is a, a contribution to game design as well. Um, and, and, um, and yeah, multi-directional, so that there are, there are ways in which the art infuses the game in a positive way and the game infuses the art in a really interesting way. Um, and they demonstrated a reduced boundary maintenance. So, Rather than games having this very insular viewpoint where, uh, you know, again, they, they were about games uh, that if you didn't have, if you hadn't already played a lot of games, you wouldn't understand how the controls work, you wouldn't understand how the interactions work. Uh, they um, kind of gave up on the idea of whether or not you needed to be a, you needed to understand how games worked uh, and um, that. You know, and they gave up that question of whether or not something was a real game or not, which I thought was really, which I think is really important. Um, so the idea of being a real game is going away, which is good because it's a horrible notion that should definitely have died, died a million deaths a long time ago. Um, and uh, and finally, uh, there's uh, they demonstrated an increased focus, and I think this is what helps tie these things together, an increased focus on experiential aesthetics. So um, one thing that that games excel in and why I think that they're a powerful interactive form is that they provide a nice scaffolding and context for enacting um, and um, creating a structure around experiences. And those experiences have a certain feel. You know, they make you feel like you are empowered. Or they make you feel like you are relaxed. They make you feel like you're carried along with an experience. Or they make you feel kind of tense and edgy, like you need to kind of be, re be reacting in a specific way. Um, so, um, and I think that all of those projects really played upon what the experience felt like, what the social context was, how the game encouraged you to interact with other people. Um, it provided that structure for it. So, um, so these are things that I, uh, with the two projects I'm working on now, are always kind of in the, in, in the back of my mind. That I think that, that this is sort of an ideal that I would like to move towards, where you know you had both both sides um, really providing really substantive, really interesting um, roles in um, in these artworks. And I'm not I'm not sure if I would hit it, but we'll um, but at the very least we'll see. So the first project I'm going to uh, I'm going to show is um, at a prototype stage. 
It's a, um, so I want to make it very clear what you're seeing is a prototype. It looks like a prototype. It's made out of styrofoam. <laughs> That's it. Um, uh, uh, mostly because the tech underneath it is actually fairly complicated, and what it is is a playable sculpture. Uh, it's actually a networked playable sculpture, so it uses, uh, it takes advantage of a number of kind of technologies that are, I guess, part of the like, Internet of Things, and the idea behind it is that this, that it is one sculpture that can be instantiated in any number of, of, of locations, but it's also a playable sculpture. Um, so here's the, <laughs> again, prototype, prototype. This is, I can look at it and this is so beautiful to me because there's so many pieces that took so long to get working together, um, but then I, I also appreciate you, everybody can look at it and go, oh, it's playable. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and this isn't the pu this isn't the, what the um, the puzzle would look like in the end. But um, so, um, so what we wanted to do with this, this is a collaboration with Jane Tingley, who is a, um, a sculptor and new media artist. Uh, she had a work at um, Nuit Blanche last year, uh, which was um, uh, housed in OCAD. Um, uh, she's probably also really well known for uh, something called uh, 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 Droid. It's like a um, it's, it's a high fashion uh, robotic dress. Um, that was a collaboration with, um, uh, with, with folks kind of working in that area. Um, anyway, so, um, so yes, and she is the sculptor behind this project, so, so this will look beautiful. Um, again, I think it looks beautiful anyway, but it will look more beautiful. Um, uh, Marius Kintel, who is, um, if you do any 3D printing, he um, is actually the fellow behind uh, OpenSCAD, um, working kind of on back-end technologies for that. Um, and me. Um, and so what I'm bringing to this project, so this is a... Um, this is a digital media sculpture. Sculpture. This is a, um, a almost like a, a situated, almost um, not an installation piece, but you know, it's a standalone uh, digital artwork. So, um, but what um, kind of Jane's vision for this was to have something that was um, that provided kind of scaffolding for playful encounters with, with different people when they account when they come up to the to the um, uh, to the sculpture. This is the sculpture. So it actually has a number of different states that it can be in. One is a light state, which shines kind of light into, um, into the space and kind of creates a, um, a light-driven environment. Uh, that light state has a companion uh, game that, uh, uh, that, that is part of it. And the idea is that if you're a single person and you go up to the, the sculpture, you can play the game. Nobody has to be um, at or engage with any of the other sculptures anywhere that they happen, uh, and you can play the game on your own, and you can advance the sculpture to the next state, which is a shadow state. So the shadow state casts kind of this sort of shadows out into the space, and the shadow state has its own game. This is actually part, um, this, this game right here on the bottom is part, will eventually be part of the shadow state. Um, once you kind of play through that game, you can advance the sculpture into um, the uh, final state, I don't know what that state is called. Every state has a name, but um, it's sort of it's the it's essentially the neutral state. It's kind of the regular kind of state of the sculpture, um, and and then eventually it goes and it kind of um, you can get it to a um, kind of a celebration uh, experience of it, and then it goes back to its <coughs> original state again. Um, and it will um, and it can be in any. It doesn't return to the beginning unless you cycle through it in the end. So, um, but the challenge with this is what we want to do is because this is the same object that just is a number of, in a number of different physical locations and possibly some online ones as well, if somebody else is at another um, kind of instance of the sculpture, they can also play the game with you. And so I've been trying to design these puzzle games where one person can play it, but two people can play it better. Or uh, two people can play it uh, in a more enhanced way, that you actually get a little bit more from it if more people are there. But um, you can still play it as an individual. Um, you don't necessarily need to connect with people. So the, um, the play experience is designed as a way to give people a sense of connecting and working with people without using language who are also having the same experience that you're having with a sculpture that's in a different location. Uh, so that's the, um, so you can probably guess some of the technical challenges that are involved with that, but also, um, uh, there are interesting kind of game design challenges that we've hit along the way, um, in part because the game is being used as this, um, here's a taller version of this. This is actually from a playtest 
um, that we ran at, uh, at Sheridan College. Um, and playtesting this has been very interesting because it, in, a, in ways it's very, um, I've, I've had to try to construct games that are simple enough so that you do not need to know anything about games in order to play them, um, which is in, in and of itself is very, um, is very challenging. Uh, but also, um, because it is contextualized in a lot, in a lot of cases as an artwork, um, there have just been issues that you don't necessarily think of in terms of what the expectations are from, say, an audience that would be familiar with games and, the, and expectations were, are from an audience um, that's more familiar uh, with more freeform art, art pieces. Uh, as an example, and I don't mean to pick, I'm not going to say who this person is because um, I feel like I'm always picking on them. But one of our playtesters, who's a fine artist, <coughs> is going through, I mean, they've been trying to figure out how to give a lot of feedback in, uh, in the work so that people know when they're doing something correctly and they know when they're doing something incorrectly. So at one point we had an area where, you know, if you did it incorrectly, we were playing around, we were playing around with different ideas for that feedback. But at one point we were using red, red lights. So if you touched the wrong area or the wrong interface or the wrong button, it would, um, you, you would get kind of a flash of red lights. Um, and this, this fellow kept, every time it flashed red, he would just go ahead and like, he would touch it again. And he's like, why are you, so I mean, I mean, we kind of let him do what he, I mean, it's also, um, because it is playable, I've left the design open to play, so if you just want to play around and see what it does, it does, it does speak back to you. There are rewards for just, um, you know, engaging in freeform play with it. Um, but we, you know, obviously we did ask him eventually, why did you keep hitting the button we were trying to tell you it was wrong? And he's just like, oh, well, it kept... It kept showing up red, and just red to me just meant like heat and passion. I felt like I was getting warmer. I felt like it was, <laughs> I felt that it was, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, I, I liked that it responded to me, and I was like, I was, you know, communicating with the sculpture. And, um, yeah, and we just, <laughs> yeah, well, and, but the thing is, it's just, it's a different, you know, different expectations from, a, from an audience. Um, game design tends to be, um, game, Again, this is a generalization, but game design tends to be intensely conservative in terms of its symbols and iconography. Um, and uh, then we were kind of dealing with playtesters who were uh, used to having very freeform, open, interactive experiences that were open to a lot of interpretation. Um, gamers hate interpretation. Uh, try to have an open-ended, like an ending to a game which isn't crystal clear, and all of a sudden the you know, forums are all lit up about how horrible that is. Um, but, um, but artists, in a lot of cases, they they want freeform interpretation. They don't want things to be constrained. They don't. They're not looking for the real meaning of the work. They're looking to see what possible meanings can emerge from the work. Uh, which this gives you interesting. It was one of the interesting challenges to play te play testing this. Um, so these are the game influences. So it's kind of fun. So this is an artwork with game influences. Uh, some of the game influences include, uh, uh, you know, puzzle. This is from a game called The Room, which kind of deals with unlocking this um, this magic uh, this magic box. Uh, for the shadow puzzle, we were looking at games that had, um, you know, tablet games that had custom elements where you would move um, and uh, kind of integrate shadows together. Um, but again, you know, a lot of these um, these examples are very um, are very prescriptive. You know, you're, you know, construct the ducky or construct the, you know, this letter or something like that. Uh, you know, we wanted something more interpretively open. But how do you create a shadow puzzle, which is also, which has a correct answer because it's a puzzle, but is also interpretively open. But you want people to know when you, that they've actually hit the right solution to the puzzle. So, um, so there's been just been very uh, kind of interesting game design challenges from that uh, from that perspective. Um, I'm kind of, I'm, here's this really quick, I'm going to play this for two seconds because I don't want to run over time, but, uh, this is just a play test that we had. There's, there's sound for it, but I'm not, um, I'm not going to play this out. So this is us, <laughs> this is us play testing it, um, <laughs> without the functionality working for it. So we're, sim we're trying to simulate here. Being in two different locations, which is why we're ignoring each other, by the way, because we're not actually co-present in this example. Um, so I'm going through, try, kind of picturing what, how, how it plays when those lights are lighting up, but it's not me who's doing it. Whether or not I can figure out that there's somebody else who's there who's playing it with me. Um, there's no computer connected to this thing that plays, no? Um, there is a. 
Yeah, there's simulated versions of it. Like there is a, um, um, connected elements of it. But at this point, we're try we're just trying to figure out what, how that should be, how it should be structured. Before we actually get some sense of what we want to build, before we actually uh, we actually build it overall. <laughs> um, oh, wait a minute. No, no. In this one, I am playing. This, sorry, I am actually playing the computer in this one. <laughs> so I am. So I'm going around and I'm lighting up the lights. And Jane, and this is Jane. Uh, and Jane is trying to find out where the lights are. You can't hear me saying bloop every time I put a little thing on, but I'm blooping. Um, and. Uh, She's trying to locate it, and um, it gets quicker as it kind of goes goes by. This is the very first game that's um, a, that's a part of it. Underneath, it's pretty much whack-a-mole. Um, but <laughs> when you see it integrated into it, sometimes the I mean, if it's not if it's not about the game itself, sometimes the simple games are are, are best. Um, I mean, really, what we want people to do is um, uh, is is collaborate, have some way of connecting with people in a different location. We don't need a really complicated game to do it. We need something that they can look at and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I understand how this works. Although you'd be surprised at how many people don't understand how Wacom really works. Um, so that's kind of my example of a, um, so that's a, a artwork which I'm trying to kind of bring game design in and some of the issues that are um, uh, involved with taking that approach to it. Um, so the other project that I'm working on is a um, commercial project now. Um, it didn't start as a commercial project. And actually, funny, funny enough, um, when we first designed this game, my sense of it and every game that was designed um, for the event that this one was designed for was that they were completely unsellable, uncommercializable games, <laughs> um, which is hilarious that now we've actually managed to commercialize it in some way. Um, so it's a game called Super Hypercube, and uh, this one I um, co-designed with um, my collaborators in Kokoromi. Um, as Roberta said in the intro introduction, it, uh, it, we're a, we started out as an experimental art game collective, and we <coughs> created games and created events and challenges and contexts that were trying to get people to push the boundaries of what you could do with game design. Um, specifically, we would host these events called uh, Gamma, which were these sort of large-scale uh, I guess you'd call them art parties now, but that kind of gives you a bad sense of what it actually uh, actually is. But they would be events that would uh, integrate uh, games, electronic music, and oftentimes um, a kind of digitally um, uh, digital artworks that were kind of along that were along those themes. Uh, and we would uh, kind of challenge game creators, anybody really who wanted to make a game for this, to create these five minute games that would essentially be the visualist entertainment or like the VJ entertainment for. Um, for, for this event, uh, along certain themes. So this one uh, was created for an event called Gamma 3D, which was designed to get people to uh, explore um, anaglyphic 3D stereoscopy. And the reason why we did it was because this was when, the year that this happened, this, is, this game was actually, the first version of it was in 2008. Um, I'll show you an embarrassing picture of myself. Uh, so, in, uh, so in 2008, when this game was created, the... Uh, 3D televisions were and screens were all the rage through the 3D glasses. I mean, you still find 3D very prominent in movie theaters and things. Um, increasingly, people don't want to put the sweaty glasses on their face. Um, and uh, so we would kind of go around, and whatever was hyped that year, we would challenge game creators to do the exact opposite of what that thing is. Um, with this one, we didn't quite go the opposite of 3D, but we went with this really basic technology to use the red blue 3D glasses mm -hmm. and we challenged people to create five minute games that would use 3D in a way that was integral to the gameplay, not just the visual effect. Uh, as it turns out, that's almost impossible to do. Uh, the, uh, there was one game that followed the rules that managed uh, to actually, that was not playable if you didn't have the 3D glasses. Uh, it was not our game. Uh, but what we um, decided when we were going through, we were playing around with different ideas, and we, what we finally figured out was that what we really wanted with 3D wasn't just the depth, but we wanted the magic window effect. We essentially wanted, wanted VR. When we heard 3D, we wanted to be able to look around and to feel like we were uh, seeing a world that had depth in it. Um, so we created this, so when we originally created Super Hypercube, we put every single possible depth cube we could, we could put in it. So it, is, um, it was uh, red-blue stereoscopy, 
Uh, it obviously uses um, kind of perspective depth. Uh, and uh, then we also created this um, custom pair of 3D glasses that used a Wiimote to track uh, infrared LEDs the kind that we hot glued to the side of it uh, and, um, and did head tracking. So that the game would move with your uh, uh, with your head as you were going through it, and then you had to move your head in order to see what. Um, so what you're doing in the game is you're fitting a cluster into a wall that has a, a hole in it, but you can't see the hole in the wall unless you move your head and you actually look around the cluster. So when the cluster gets bigger, it becomes increasingly difficult to uh, to do it. Uh, so this is the game that we that we put together again. With every, I mean, at the first not the first time we showed it, the second time we showed it, we managed to slightly electrocute somebody just a little bit uh, with the glasses. I didn't make those glasses. The glasses that I made did not electrocute anybody. Um, and I actually, I mentioned this when we were talking about the history of the game at an event in, uh, uh, in Austin the last month. And somebody from the crowd yells, she's here. It turns, it turns out that the woman who we shocked at an event was actually, um, was, was there at the event. Um, as well, I didn't. I hadn't known who it was, but she had, she had actually been there. So she, she so she was okay. She wasn't she wasn't mad. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, so this game was designed um, to look very impressive on a very large screen, to be able to be picked up and played within five minutes. Everybody would be able to understand it, and everybody would uh, see it. Um, but anyway, so um, and in a way, we made a VR game before VR existed. So when VR started to kind of come back around again, as it does fairly regularly every 20 years. Um, I, my hopes is for the next, the next 20 years, it's the next 20 year one is going to be awesome. Um, but this one, I don't know, this one's going to take. But um, anyway, so the, um, yeah, ask me, ask me later what my real feelings are about the year. So um, the, uh, so yeah, so, um, uh, so once we were going to, so we got approached by Sony and they said, you know, would you be interested in putting together this game for this uh, uh, the platform that we're developing? And we're just like, yeah, that's great. We have a VR game. And we actually have been working on it for like six or seven years at that point. So we have the gameplay down. Uh, we can probably put together something fairly quickly. But what we also realized is that since we weren't using, we didn't need to use the 3D glasses anymore, that all of a sudden we had a visual palette that just was blown wi wide open. We were going to be working with a, um, a virtual reality environment, and aesthetically it could be anything we wanted it to be. Uh, and so what was uh, what was nice about that is that for the most part, a lot of the games that were being created for, for VR were just recreating worlds and experiences that people were already familiar with, or that they had already known, that they already uh, kind of had seen from, from film. Um, so this gave us an opportunity to create, um, if you were going to be immersed in a space, and we could make that world anything we wanted it to be, what were we going to make? Uh, what were the um, kind of immersive environments and experiences? Um, you know, we have, uh, between us, we actually have a fair kind of an interest in, uh, you know, um, large-scale installation pieces, um, various sorts of, of film and artistic references. Uh, we like shiny things. Um, so some of the... Um, uh, some of the influences that, that got drawn into this uh, this game, and again, so if you take this, so let me just contrast this back to the gift right here. So these are all environments that are within the game. That's our, our really quick gift trailer. Do you need to turn the light off? Uh, yeah, maybe. Um, so, um, so yeah, so obviously, so we drew upon, um, so obviously some envir environments are very strongly um, general influenced. Um, also, um, everything is kind of lit up in neon, so we looked at a lot of Dan Flavin's work. Uh, John Wick Jr. Um, has, uh, there's definitely environments that are designed to kind of place you almost in the dream of VR, you know, but from the dream of VR from like the early, from the late 70s, early 80s, uh, not necessarily the, uh, uh, the things you think about today. So it's kind of a retro futurist view of what we wanted VR to be, but what we wanted VR to be like 30 years ago. Wow. Uh, yeah, the Tron. Actually, one of the reviews for the, the game that had come out had said that this is what uh, that, that the game evoked for them, not Tron necessarily, but what the games in Tron would feel like for the people who were in them in Tron. Um, which is sort of a, it's just like, yeah, that's kind of a neat, a neat little, it doesn't just look like Tron, it feels like Tron in some way, like what it would be like to be inside of it. Um, and obviously, and they're not all highbrow influences either. This is, a, 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 this is from San, Sanity, which if you... If you are older like me, you you know that movie, but um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so this was, um, and this was our, um, uh, so this is a game, it is a very gamey game, uh, you know, at, at the end of it, it's, the, the game play itself is very simple, um, it's very similar to the Japanese game show, Hol no Um, but, uh, but what we tried to do is that we tried to use the fact that we were going to be able to create this, um, immersive space to create an immersive space, to actually create a space that felt like it had, um, that it wasn't something that we could go and visit, um, that it was something that we could play around with, um, and um, impart these really sort, sort of immersive, um, tangible, visceral images and spaces and things that we had seen uh, were major influences in putting that together. So um, I'm not going to, I know I'm, I'm probably, I'm not doing good for time, so I'm going to um, swap really quickly just to the game itself um, and show it for like two seconds, which is good because Sony probably doesn't want me to show it. So, um, so, yeah, so this is the um, prototype for the um, PSVR headset. Let's see how terrible I am. At this. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Am I even looking at the camera properly? Everybody is taking a picture of you right now. <laughs> Damn you all. You're in. Yeah. Thank you. Morning. There you go. All clear. Oh, you're not going to be able to hear the glorious... Oh, wait. You should be able to hear the sound. It's HDMI. But anyway, there's a picture in your mind in an immersive sound environment. I'll, I'll, I'll apologize to our sound designer. Um, okay, so... Um, I, can, I can go through all of the... I can advance this through tutorial stuff that we don't need to do. Okay. So, wow. yeah, so this is the game, and, oops, another one, there we go. The camera is not in the, best, in, the, in the best location. So this environment right here, I think, is, it was originally called Club Terrell, yeah. but then, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, now it's called, it's funny, because uh, half of us are Canadian, and it's just like, oh, really, Drake, you had to, everybody's going to think Canadians are just really obsessed with uh, James Terrell or something. We were scooped by Drake. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, so this is the, you can kind of look around the uh, environment as you go. Oh, you can, I mean, actually, put, I don't know if you can see the controller, but. So it's sort of like Tetris. It is, um, so it's funny because the blocks look like Tetris. Um, in a way, the gameplay is actually very different from Tetris. Um, but here, if I, I'm, there's a, there's one specific thing I want to show. So, um, so yeah, so this is the level, um, the level transition right here. Uh, and here's one of the other levels. So uh, yeah, so this one's obviously a little bit, a little bit more um, kind of, um, and then we have kind of other aesthetics for things like the time work. <laughs> what happens if you crash, crash into the wall? Ah, I can help you with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, and we can see the. <laughs> and then it kind of ramps you up a little bit again. So, yeah, so that's, um, uh, that is our, oh, and this is the end of my life. So, that's our art infused game. And, um, yes, thank you. That's